Don't be shy. Americans are used to being challenged. You said a little bit more about the evaluation of what is unacceptable action within a state and how that's developed as a notion. Because while it's quite straightforward, you might think to talk about genocide, which is where the UN started as a particular policy. If you were to take some of the wider elements and talk about climate control or food security, you might find that what is regarded, I mean, the, the where you can define acceptability seems to be an extraordinarily flexible, difficult, and perhaps the most contested area of, uh, that you've talked about. Absolutely. Well, first of all, there's, there's no universal consensus about what you might call a cons an approach to order that goes beyond the Westphalian one. So the whole idea that what goes on within a state is in any way legitimate grounds for others. There's those who object to that. Uh, but then beyond those who are, if you will, purists or minimalists, then I think you're right. There's a whole scale. There's, and some might say there's genocide. Uh, but then what other conditions, shall we say, are tolerable as opposed to intolerable? And Libya is a perfect example where there's, uh, there was no consensus, and in retrospect, certainly not. You, you almost might say there's, there was a kind of diplomatic buyer's remorse afterwards on the part of, of many. So there's, there's, there's in that area, uh, take Ebola. What are the obligations or responsibilities of a country to make sure that certain types of uh, viruses are dealt with in certain ways, or when certain types of disease have outbreaks, to report those outbreaks to others? What is the proper response when they do not, when they don't meet their obligations? Because again, in a global world, it could start in a poultry slaughterhouse in some rural area, choose a country of Indonesia, but one way or another, if it gets on the, the bandwagon of globalization, we could all be uh, affected. Or we saw it earlier with the SARS epidemic or, or what have you. But again, there's, there's nothing, there's no consensus about what's to be done other than encouragement of countries to meet, quote unquote, their, their obligations. Uh, and you could take it through climate. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's no uh, brief out there that says, here's what a country's obligations are, and here's the, here's the rights of their neighbors in the international community when they don't meet them. Uh, and so you could, you, so I think you could go from issue to issue and you could show the gap. Indeed, one of the things I'll talk about at great length tomorrow is what I call a global gap. On virtually every one of these issues, there is a, a fairly large and growing space between uh, potential challenges of the sort you're talking about and, and, the, and the quality, if you will, of the international responses and either the consensus or the efficacy of those responses. So that's, yeah, that is an enormous area of, uh, of difficulty or imperfection, quote unquote, when it comes to order. And, all, and so there's no, you know, I can't stand up here. I, I have my ideas about what ought to be in some cases, the, the principles or the mechanisms, but that, you know, that's not the way uh, things happen. But I think that's a legitimate area of concern because again, what makes it all so worrisome, it's not just from a moral point of view. We might have humanitarian views about a government's treatment of its own people or its inability to protect its own people from marauders. That's a humanitarian concern. But it's qualitatively different, and I'm not in any way minimizing that, when our concern becomes not just, a, not simply a humanitarian concern, but also concern about our own physical safety, which it is in the case of terrorists who set up shop, or diseases which are allowed to, or people contributing to climate change, or what have you. So we suddenly have a stake in what they do. And what's missing then is a mechanism that is uh, widely subscribed to. Uh, for dealing with what we see as unacceptable or irresponsible behavior that affects us, not just our sensibilities, but it could affect our physical safety or our, our, our livelihood. Uh, or in some cases, it could force people to become refugees, which would you know, obviously have other, other 
consequences. So yeah, there is a, a major gap, both in the, the thinking in the field and then in the, the, in when it comes to, again, translating ideas into actual practice when it comes to order about what one does in these situations. Because you don't want to go back, let me sort of say make one last point, sorry to go on so long. You don't want to go back to a pre-Westphalian world where everybody's intervening everybody, everywhere else all the time. A, a world in which each one of us woke up every day and we say, we don't like what's going on in our neighbor's house. That might affect us or it does affect us. We're going to intervene. That's a pre-Westphalian world and we saw what that looked like. We, and there was a name for it called the Dark Ages. Uh, so we don't, want to, we don't want to go back there. But what we don't have yet is a bridging concept for how we deal with the fact that, again, that developments within borders have consequences beyond borders, and how do we respect sovereignty but not unconditionally? And I actually think that's one of the big intellectual and ultimately policy questions of our time. Sir. Thank you. I've got an observation and a question. I, I was uh, completely um, in agreement with almost everything you said. The only thing I I'm a bit unsure about is, is your interpretation of, of Westphalia in the sense that the way you've described this tracks a little bit more the situation after the Treaty of Augsburg in, in the mid 16th century, which determined that the religion of the ruler should be the religion of the, of the ruled. Whereas, and that, of course, didn't work because it led, as, as you say, to uh, confessional mania. Whereas Westphalia actually laid down somewhat contrary to what modern international lawyers claim. Sort of the general view is, did lay down um, uh, quite clearly that outside powers could intervene. I mean, it actually had the, there were, you know, the Swedes and the French were gar officially guarantor powers of the internal order in Germany, so that if the prince abused his powers, they could go in simply, and here I agree with you, um, uh, on the grounds that if there's internal disorder, that can create an external disturbance. Um, my question, though, is to do with um, your own country's um, relationship to Rotterdam, because you you concentrated very much on Europe, and I, I realize you, uh, in the first part of your remarks, and then of course it became increasingly uh, also focused on the US. But um, surely the United States has had, at least at the beginning, uh, a much more universalistic sense of its mission in the world. Um, and if you, if you look, say, at the intervention in Cuba, uh, in 1898, isn't that also to a substantial degree justified as a humanitarian intervention against Spanish atrocities, concentration camps, and that kind of thing? Um, so that actually this, this sort of sense of intervening um, because of internal disturbances and uh, human rights abuses does go back a good deal further. Oh, it does. Uh, in the case of the United States, and I didn't get into questions of the Monroe Doctrine and all that, my simple point is, that I thought what was different about more recent history is when these ideas became global. I mean, the passage in the UN a decade ago of so-called R2P, Responsibility to Protect, to me was, was quite a, an interesting development. And, it, it, and again, it, I'm not sure it's lasted. And again, uh, but I think, so the idea that the, the US foreign policy would be somewhat animated by these ideas, uh, you're right, you're 100% you know, right, not, not particularly new. But what's different, I think, is that you had much more international sport. I think Rwanda had a, a lot to do with that and possibly also modern media, that these things would happen in ways that wouldn't be quite as invisible. And I think it, by traveling, pictures of these things, also NGOs would report things back. So I think there was a, a degree of awareness that made these issues much more, uh, you know, entered into global consciousness much more, but I think you're right, this has long been a, and indeed it's one of the recurring struggles in American foreign policy, indeed in some ways it's the most basic fault line of American foreign policy, which is to what extent ought American foreign policy be animated by such concerns. I mean, something I said before, that the principal focus of foreign policy ought to be foreign policy, there is, as you know, the alternative school in American foreign policy, usually attributed to Woodrow Wilson, is the principal focus of foreign policy ought not to be. It ought to be on domestic policy of others, either for moral concerns or practical concerns on the basis that how countries conduct their business within their borders is a pretty good indicator of how they will conduct their business beyond their borders. So if you can make them more democratic 
and responsible at home, they're much more likely to be, to be more responsible and tolerant and peace-loving uh, abroad. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not sure they would buy the word interference. Uh, they would see it as meeting their constitutional obligations. The most famous constitutional scholar in the United States used to be, I think, a professor at Columbia University, if I have my schools right, and described the American Constitution as an invitation for, for the struggle over the control of American foreign policy. And the Constitution is, is maddeningly sparse. And for the most part, the Supreme Court has uh, elected to stand aside and basically say, we can, we're not going to adjudicate these things. So throughout American history, uh, you've had friction. And for quite a while during the Cold War and through the early part of Vietnam, the pendulum straw went, swung dramatically in the direction of executive primacy. If you remember Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s imperial presidency. And, the, and starting with basically the 70s, you saw a clawing back in some ways of executive power and the pendulum was pulled the other way uh, by Congress by writing laws that in the high water mark was the attempt to limit the president's war power, the war powers resolution, which effectively didn't uh, work. I think after then, again, in some ways 9-11, we had a, a new assertion of executive primacy. I think it's being pulled back then. In my experience, usually people in opposition are much more f in favor of congressional uh, voice, and people sitting in White Houses tend to be much more skeptical of, uh, of them. So I, I don't think this is fundamentally new. And I think actually the potential compromise on the Iran legislation, for one, could be quite healthy, because it would give Congress, one way or another, Congress is going to have a say because they, they would have to lift sanctions at some point. The president can't do that for most of the sanctions. So it's inevitable anyhow. So we're talking about the form of it. So, but I, I think it's simply a reality that, you know, presidents have the upper hand in foreign policy. That's true, but they're not the only player. You know, that's, it's a balance. So I think we have executive primacy. Like everything else in life, it's a, it's a question of, Degree. I mean, we're about to have a massive political battle in our country about trade, and we'll see how that plays out. But I, traditionally, you know, foreign policy is, the Constitution does give the, the executive a degree of initiative. And the, 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 the question is not just oversight, but to what extent is it shared powers? And uh, it's, it's imprecise, and that's why it kind of waxes and wanes. And we're, I'm never sure the difference between a wax and a wane, but we're seeing one or the other now. Yes, sir. Yeah, another uh, big feature of the past um, 20 years or so has been the rise of China. Would you say that China was part of the forces of order or of disorder? That's a good question. Uh, talk about it a lot tomorrow. I would simply say that for in various parts of its history, China has been somewhat different. For most of the last three or four decades, though, China has focused on internal development. The whole Deng Xiaoping theory of China was to essentially push for stability on its periphery and its external so it could focus on development at home. So China wasn't, for the most part, much of a participant in a lot of uh, things. Now, a couple of important exceptions. One is the Chinese have been as strong as anybody that what goes on inside a country is their business alone. The idea of sovereignty as something close to absolute has been very powerful uh, principle for China in its foreign policy. Hence, basically, its reaction to criticisms was after Tiananmen Square. And in general, uh, if you look at the principles of Chinese foreign policy under leaders from Mao, or Zhou Enlai, more recent stuff, that hasn't changed. There's a very strong state, it's very Westphalian to use the, uh, the, the language of this, uh, of this talk. China has not, for the most part, used uh, 
armed force to advance its uh, foreign policy. Now, th th in certain areas, they would say it's internal policy. When they approach things like, you know, what they see as their territory, parts of China, they don't see that as a foreign policy question. So you end up in a, a different debate, but whether it's Taiwan or Tibet and things like that, they see those as through a domestic mm -hmm. prism, not through an international uh, prism. There was, they used force in the early 50s in the Korean War, but that was only after international forces crossed the 38th parallel. China intervened heavily in order to prevent the unification of, uh, of the Korean peninsula. You know, I, could go, I could go around the world, but I, I, I would say that up to now, two things come to mind. One is China's principal focus on protecting its internal space, both in the phys physical sense, but also in the political sense. And so they're taking a very uh, large view of, um, of, of sovereignty. I think the question going forward, which is as China becomes a more powerful country and more of a global actor, is what, what is its definition of world order? What does China come to view as, it, how does it define success for itself? And that's an interesting question. And I don't think we know the answers. We're seeing some debates in the Chinese open literature. But what is it China's going to try to bring about in Asia? What would they try to bring about in the, the rest of the world, either in terms of proceed, what's their definition of legitimacy in terms of either outcomes or, or procedures? So, but I, you know, I, but I don't see China, at least so far, you know, again, one, one, area, one gray zone, you know, trying to over, I don't see, I guess I put this I do not see China as a quote unquote revolutionary country to use Kissinger's uh, lexicon. But I do think there are questions about how it deals in particular with the region where it's clearly pushing up against, uh, against certain limits. So we'll just, you know, I think, so I think it's an open question. As China becomes stronger, what kind of a role it plays and how it, how it decides what its preferred definition of order is and how it prefers or how it chooses to go about uh, bringing it about. And I, and I would say one of the goals of, of U.S. And, and policy of others ought to be to influence how China answers those questions. I don't think these things are baked into the cake. I think that we have potential ways of incentivizing or encouraging certain behavior and discouraging others. And I think that's part of what our policy uh, needs, needs to be. And that ought to be, if you will, the goal of our statecraft in a strategic sense and the purpose of diplomacy in a tactical sense to get China to use its growing power, uh, to use a phrase, as a responsible stakeholder to see it act in certain ways and to not see it act in, in other ways. But I, I think that's one of the big questions. And again, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I think this century it turns out to be very different depending upon what the answer is to, to your question. It's a very different quality of international life depending upon how China comes to view success, how it comes to define order for itself, and how it then acts about those, uh, on those definitions. Yes, sir. You talk about some of the you know, high water marks of Western and U.S. diplomacy. And I was just wondering about your thoughts on uh, what we need to learn from some of the failures of uh, U.S. diplomacy to, in its, in, in, to be more successful in influencing political settlements in a context like Iraq and Afghanistan and um, Libya today. Um, are, are we seeing some kind of clear? And, and, and you talked before also about the cost for when uh, states um, don't behave well. Um, um, and, and perhaps we, we're, we're seeing you know, an enormous influence of the Department of Defense with its special operations in many, many, many <coughs> Well, there's not clear lessons in the sense of widely accepted lessons because you mentioned conflicts in every case. And in my experience, every war is fought three times. First, you have the debate over whether to go to war. Then you fight the war. Then you have the debate about the lessons. And so we're, we're debating in some ways the lessons. And I think the biggest one, it comes back to the previous question, 
about the tradition in American foreign policy or the debate about trying to shape internal outcomes, which is how ambitious do you get? And you know, to what extent should we consider using armed force to remake the, the insides of other countries? What ought to be the, uh, what ought to be the goals if we, if we undertake such projects? And then the question is, what's not simply desirable, but what's feasible? And I would simply say, you know, in, in Libya, it was one thing to intervene to oust Muammar Gaddafi. But as bad as he was, it's very hard for anyone, I think, to stand up here and say what's happened in Libya since is an improvement. And you could probably say similar things about several of Libya's neighbors in that part of the world. So to me, you've really got to play chess and not checkers whenever you intervene and think through what are the local realities, how are they likely to react to what it is you do, uh, what, what, what's, a reason, what's, a, what's an available outcome at what cost, and how does, that com how does that compare with other outcomes at, say, lower costs or with the status quo. And I would simply say that in many cases, I, of late, the United States has gotten too ambitious in its, in its goals and overlooked local realities. And that's, a, to me, an unhealthy situation. And again, almost, I mentioned before that you know, there's, no atom, there's no invisible hand in the geopolitical marketplace. Well, there's no invisible hand in these orders. When you take away in a country that's been very top heavy, when you, when you kill a king, so to speak, uh, what, it's, it's not in any way uh, inevitable. Indeed, it's not likely that suddenly new forms of order will emerge in its, in its place. You have none of the DNA there. You have none of the habits. You have none of, in many cases, you don't have the civil society or the prerequisites. So I just think we need to be you know, very careful in saying that certain flawed orders are unacceptable. We need to be very conscious of uh, what might be the uh, prospects and the costs for trying to bring about a less flawed order. And I, I just think in many cases, uh, we have, um, we have gotten that wrong. Yes, ma'am. Do you think um, that there are different conditions um, of order for different countries, like depending on their size and power? So China, you might say, has absolute sovereignty, um, and no one's going to invade them. It doesn't matter what, you know, what injustices befall the country, whereas other countries, um, which are slightly weaker, may have conditional sovereignty. And it's it's a great question. Uh, as a matter of law, no. And probably as a matter of philosophy, no. <laughs> but you hear where I'm getting to. Uh, as a matter of our practice, sure. And I would say it this way. With, the, with certain countries, you've got a full menu of interests say, in the old days with the Soviet Union or now with China, you've got interests from all sorts of economic interests to all sorts of political military interests to humanitarian interests, what have you. You've got a, they're a large number and they're large in scale. So you'd have to ask yourself, uh, okay, imagine tomorrow there's a crackdown in China, more than we're seeing already. And we obviously wouldn't like it on human rights terms. But then we'd have to ask ourselves, if we reacted in certain ways, expressing our displeasure, other types of reactions, how might it, have, you have to ask yourself two things. Will it make China's internal behavior any better? And the fact that they're big and strong, they have the ability to push back. So you gotta look at the efficacy of it. And then second of all, how might they retaliate about other things we care about? And we care about stability on the Korean Peninsula. We care about stability in Asia. We care about the fact that China is holding more than a trillion dollars in dollar reserves. We care. You go around the world. We care about climate change. There's almost no issue that we don't care about where China doesn't have a stake and the ability to affect that interest. So then you have to sit back and say, well, gee, we may not like what they're doing, or we do not like what they're doing and how they treat their own people. But on the other hand, we probably can't affect it much, and we have to think about the repercussions for other things. And in the old days about the Soviet Union, it was a similar conversation. 
It was really important to keep the relationship stable, to say, do what we wanted to do with um, nuclear, to make sure you know, arms control succeeded. So you know, there was a constant debate in the United States, how do we deal with Soviet dissidents? How do we deal with the human rights issues in the Soviet Union? What kind of priority do, they, do you give them? It's a, it's a struggle. And I think with countries that are smaller in scale, you simply don't have as many interests that are competing. So for better or worse, you have uh, the ability, I won't say luxury, but you have the ability, if you want, to focus more on certain things. So quite honestly, in some, in some country, wherever it is, in the Middle East or Africa or Latin America, we may not have large strategic or economic stakes. So we may have the ability to allow our behavior to largely be determined by how we react to a humanitarian thing. So you can say, well, that would be inconsistent. And I would say yes. Uh, in foreign policy, inconsistency, it may or may not be a virtue, but it's a necessity. The idea of a one-size-fits-all foreign policy, I would think, is a prescription for failure. But you've got to be aware of it. And you've got to, I think, at times, be willing to answer that kind of a question about why in this case you're either doing something or why in another case you're not doing something. And, I, and you have to be prepared to answer both questions. But you, again, you just, you're not going to be able to be consistent, but you're going to have to deal then with the question of inconsistency. Sir. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did you have your hand up? No, yeah, no. Youth served. We, uh, uh, sorry, I think students get asked for it. I just, you mentioned earlier on, I think you were referring in the context of the end of the 19th century, but you mentioned the importance, the significance of human agency. Um, and I was wondering, um, through all the changes in war order that you described, what do you, and, and as a practitioner yourself, a uh, foreign practitioner uh, as a diplomat at the State Department, um, how, how has the role of the diplomat changed? Not just policymakers. Well, another good question. It's changed a lot. I mean, in the old days, we were talking about the Congress of Vienna or something. When we used to send an ambassador somewhere, we'd give him a, you know, it might be several months before he got a new instruction. Uh, if you were Ben Franklin running off to Paris, you, know, you didn't get micromanaged out of Washington. Uh, now you got emails and uh, cables. It's, it's, and tele it's, diplomats had a lot more autonomy and a lot more of a role, by and large, simply because you couldn't micromanage them. And so now it's just a different role. Now they can still make a difference, and a good ambassador, uh, two types of diplomats, there's, there's, there's those diplomats who are resident and those who are sent out. Uh, a good ambassador can still make a real difference in two ways, both in making sure his own government has a real feel for what's going on, and second of all, not just representing his government, but I, uh, the best ambassadors in some ways insinuate themselves into the host country's policy making process. Really good ambassadors to Washington, it's as if they had a seat at the National Security Council table. They're really good, they work the town, they talk to people in Congress, they talk to people at the State Department, the Pentagon, they, they get inside things. And that's what you want, so I, you, your best ambassadors have a way of, become, to use a trite word, becoming players, often in private in their host countries, but they can influence in some ways the considerations of the host countries. That, that's what you, I think, ideally, they're, they become influencers where they are. They can often convene large part. Another thing ambassadors can do is convene parts of society that often can't normally convene. It turns out, in some cases, the British ambassadors dining room table or the American ambassador's dining room table can become a space where all sorts of uh, opposition figures can come together. In Washington often the British Embassy is a place where people come together. And so you can play a, a role in, if you will, in the civil society of another country. And again, you can report stuff back home uh, faithfully. I think for someone who's not resident, a, a special envoy up to the Secretary of State or what have you, that's different. There you've got often different missions. You're not there in the day to day. You've got more specific tasks. You've often got a um, more seniority in certain ways, an ability to affect certain issues. And then you just have to decide, again, 
what your, your focus is going to be. And, and I'll have a lot to say about this, but how much you deal with uh, crises, which is the pressure, and how much you try to carve out a lot of time to deal with issues before they become crises. You know, every business, if you read the business literature about how a CEO runs a firm, there's constant reiteration of the idea of don't, don't allow the urgent to crowd out the important. And the same thing is true of diplomacy at, you know, you, and statecraft. You have to be very wary not to allow the urgent crowd out the uh, important, but that's the, that's, that's the tendency. The young man behind you, and then we're going to respond here. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to ask about that, oh, the idea of applying the concept of world order across ages and across different systems and distributions. Do you define it as a set of commonly accepted rules with a distribution of power to back up those rules? And, and the corollary is then disorder, which reflects the actors that reject the existing arrangements. Um, to what extent do you think it's removing the, the notion of Well, you're getting it. Disorder yeah. are the ones that are trying to upset the uh, given apple chart. Look, I'll talk about it at great length tomorrow, as it turns out. But uh, I'll simply say that it's harder and harder to talk about world order in the singular sense. First of all, you've got lots of them going on. You could have a pretty good situation in Latin America and a pretty lousy situation in the Middle East. You have some things that could be. Uh, some, some issues globally could be fairly well organized, some issues not. So it's, it's, it's harder and harder to speak of it generally. And as I said today, it gets tougher when you have a wider range of participants or actors or players who can, who can make a difference. Well, I actually think it's much tougher today. You've got a much wider canvas and you've got, I could really, many more paint brushes and a lot more paint. I can really strain the metaphor. And so I think it's, it's, the challenge today is much tougher. I actually, you know, as good as Metternich and Talleyrand and Castlereagh were, uh, this is tougher. They had an ability to just deal with a few other points and they had the ability to, you know, they didn't have a, you know, Twitter to worry about. And they had tremendous authority and they had big questions and I'm not in any way diminishing it, but there was a small number of big questions and a very small number of big actors. And without taking away anything from how creative and talented they were, I do think the demands today are greater. One of the reasons I get, I get uneasy because there's so many issues and so many actors who can make a difference. And in some cases, you, you can't gather them all. And it's, it's become, I believe, a, a much more difficult environment for diplomats and others to operate in. And I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing an erosion of order. If you, if you added it all up and, or a growth in disorder is simply because you've got you know, a diffusion of power, a decentralization of decision making, and it's just harder to, to orchestrate. And I think that's one of the reasons if you, you know, an analogy I sometimes use is you, uh, if you had a share of stock that sold on the London Exchange, and it was called World Order LLC or whatever, World Order Inc., it would have suffered something of a correction of late. <laughs> Not a crash, but a correction. And, uh, and I don't want it to be a bear market in order. I don't want this to continue, but I think you know, uh, the potential is there for that. And so I, it's one of the reasons that uh, you know, I wanted to talk about this subject, because I, I do think that this is, this is a qualitatively different period because we don't have the structure of multilateralism. We don't have the structure of bilateralism. We don't have the structure of unipolarity. This is something much more diffuse. So it's qualitatively different and qualitatively more difficult. That's a very good point. Thank you.